Kind of paint a picture for <clears throat> what we're dealing with within the finances of college athletics right now. It might be some things that you've you know studied in class. Certainly, if you're reading headlines, you're reading you know headlines. A lot of these different issues we're dealing with. If you look at the, the top center part of this slide, <clears throat> this chart right here just illustrates the revenues of the sports industry over roughly a 15-year period of time. The primary revenue streams being um, merchandise, sponsorship sales, gate revenue, which is ticket sales, and then media rights. You kind of see how the the revenue streams have shifted over this 15-year period of time. You back up 15 years ago, there was more money coming out of merchandise from a percentage standpoint and, and gate revenue than sponsorships and media rights combined. If you fast forward. 15 years, you can see how the media rights, percentage of revenues coming from media rights has grown. Sponsorship, the TV deals are out there, really has been a tremendous growth in the sports industry. You see that with professional sports, you see that with college athletics. So we're in this period of time where there's more resources coming into the sports industry, primarily through the media rights agreements that you see in professional sports and college athletics. So we've been in this period of time of more resources available, more ways to invest back into your sports teams. Um, the upper left part of this, I mean, just an illustration of a, a facility project, Texas A&M Football Stadium. And this is probably a decade ago that they did the big project. But just an example, it was almost a half billion dollar project investing back into <clears throat> the football stadium, investing back into how they generate revenue to support their program. So over time, the dollars that have been um, generated from athletic programs, and this is true of professional sports <clears throat> and then college athletics, many of those dollars have been pumped back into facilities. Here at the University of Arkansas, you know, we've spent you know, roughly $350 million over a 10-year period. Um, it's our football stadium. Um, it's the team building supporting all of our teams. We're looking at a basketball arena project, but a lot of dollars have gone back into facility projects. If you shift to the <clears throat> upper right part of the screen, again, just another example. Coaching change a few years ago at LSU was you know, roughly a $100 million uh, commitment from uh, that athletic program investing in a football coach investing back in their football program. A lot of dollars have gone back into coaching contracts. That's how we've seen dollars spent over the last really 15 years, primarily in facility projects and back into coaching contracts. You shift to the lower left-hand side of the screen, you know, back up a couple years ago, uh, there was a, there's just been a number of lawsuits throughout college athletics. Uh, one in particular went all the way to the Supreme Court where the Supreme Court ruled in favor of student athletes and against the NCAA with the limitations they had in place for student athletes being able to uh, receive additional benefits, really open the door for changes in some regulations and what we're seeing with NIL over the last couple of years. So we're now in this period of more dollars, more benefits going to student athletes, being able to monetize their name, image, and likeness and again, if you're tracking headlines, you're seeing this every day. The student athletes, many doing it a legitimate way. They've got a name and image of, and a likeness that companies want to associate with. And uh, you, you know, you see some of the dollars flowing to student athletes. You see these collectives popping up and organizing donors to generate support to uh, support student athletes. So we're now in this period where we're shifting in some ways, and the questions being asked, shifting away from dollars into facility projects, are we shifting away from dollars into coaching contracts and in this period where more dollars are going back to student athletes? And over this period of time, you've seen that in the past, you, know, you back up a decade ago and a scholarship to a student athlete is all you could provide. And that was tuition, room and board and books. 
NCAA opened some regulations and then you can provide up the cost of attendance. The Supreme Court ruling hits a couple years ago and you can provide what's called the Austin payments. Additional dollars for us, roughly $6,000 per student athlete per year, dollars that can be paid excuse me, paid to student athletes. And then within IL opening up, student athletes having that ability to monetize their name, image, and likeness. So a little bit of the background of, of the dollars flowing through <clears throat> college athletics, the sports industry, how they've been spent over time, kind of the shift we're seeing. The bottom, you know, center part of this slide is just, you know, obviously very recent in our minds is the impact of COVID and what we had to deal with, with managing athletics, managing finances, when the entire world shuts down <clears throat> and sporting events are not happening and you lose your revenues that are generated from sporting events. And so that's not too far in the back of our mind and the rear view mirror of what happens if you don't have sports and how do you, you know, fund the commitments that you have. So that, that just sets the stage a little bit for the finances and what we've been dealing with within college athletics, this right here uh, is just a chart for Razorback athletics over a almost 20 year period of time. You back up two decades ago and we were a, you know, less than $50 million a year in revenues for an athletic program of 19 teams. You fast forward two decades and now we're at $170 million for those same 19 teams. And the bulk of the dollars again are coming in <clears throat> from media rights, tickets, donations and sponsorships um, to support our athletic program and just illustrate how those revenues and expenses have grown over time. For but us- I One question before we get sure. too far away from the topic. Uh, you mentioned COVID and how that significantly impacted collegiate sport. You just showed the, the chart there with the dip around the time of the pandemic. Uh, we read an article from the Associated Press, Eric Olson with the Associated Press, uh, he interviewed two different D1 athletic departments and found that revenues nor expenditures across Division One have really returned to pre-pandemic levels when adjusted for inflation. Is that something that you've noticed as well? Do y'all not? Do we? Do y'all think about it in terms, or how has that affected your program? Yeah. So in COVID, you know, absolutely smacked everybody in the face, right? Nobody was expecting in March of 2020 that the world's going to shut down and you're not going to have sports and not going to have the revenue supporting your sports. So we were no different than anybody else. We shut down and then kind of quickly started coming up with a plan of how do we, how do we ret return to whatever normal was going to look like? <clears throat> you know, we had a the impact of COVID for us was really over about a two year period of time. And we attacked it from a couple different levels. You know, we committed early on, we were not going to cut sports, going to not cut benefits to student athletes. We refinanced debt you know, we cut, um, you know, where we were traveling to, we cut operational expenses. We cut salaries for a period of time, but made that commitment not to cut sports or, or uh, participation opportunities so we scaled things way back got through covid and then we came out really really strong and, and we're kind of in a period for the last two years of playing catch up in a lot of ways you know the things we had to we might have held off replacing a piece of equipment during covid might have held off on a facility maintenance project during covid held off on you know certain travel uh commitments that we had Coming out of COVID, we found ourselves in a period of now almost spending more just to play catch up over the last two two years. But we came out strong. The uh, attendance returned, ticket sales returned. Obviously, you got your media rights revenue, you got some sponsorship revenue. So we've had dollars to support the program. But coming out of COVID with inflation, absolutely, we're still spending dollars the same way. It's just costing considerably more to operate the athletic program than it than it did pre-COVID. That answers your question, Shelby. Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. And that's really what we're trying to manage going forward. Um, and, and we're in the midst of a budgeting process now. We meet with all of our <clears throat> all of our coaches, all of our department heads, talking about 
you know, their operating budgets, their recruiting budgets, their travel budgets, and trying to set some priorities going forward. We know costs are up. We know it's more difficult to travel, more difficult to operate within the same budgets that we've had in the past. We know costs are up. Uh, and then we know there's new demands on the, the revenues with a lot of those demands being additional benefits to student athletes. And then just to mention too, just again, tracking the headlines, you you know the future is gonna look different than the past. It's gonna look different than it is today. Are student athletes employees is a question that's out there. Does the division one of college athletics look different than it has in the past is a question that's out there. And a lot of that's gonna be tied around the type of benefits that you're providing to student athletes. So we know costs are up and we know in the future dollars are going to have to be spent differently with more of those dollars going to directly to student athletes. And then just to share, um, again, just as we're thinking about revenues and the dollars we have, roughly a third of our revenues come from the SEC and NCAA distribution. This is really where all the media rights agreements are held. So the conference has the regular season TV packages, the conference championship events and CBLA has the you know the men's basketball tournament obviously the the largest revenue driver for the NCAA college football playoffs uh, bowl game agreements they have the media rights agreements for postseason football but roughly a third of our revenues now coming from SEC and NCAA distributions uh, sponsorship agreements are right at 15 percent that's us selling local sponsorships to uh, different entities to support the Razorbacks. So we're a Nike school. We generate revenue through a Nike agreement. We know in the future, you know, for example, for us, our football stadium naming rights expires after this coming football season. So we're going to have the opportunity to go out there and sell a new naming rights agreement to generate some additional revenue to support the department. And then ticket sales and contributions. Uh, for us, that's football, that's men's basketball, that's baseball is where we sell, you know, the, the bulk of our tickets and have the bulk of our donations. You know, it's nearly half of our revenue is back to selling tickets and uh, generating donations to support the department. So that's how the revenue comes in. Uh, SEC, NCAA distributions, again, like I mentioned on media rights, how these revenues have grown <clears throat> over the last decades that spike in 2021 was during COVID as the SEC advanced some dollars to each athletic program to uh, help manage the impact of COVID so that was a one-time payment but you can see where those dollars uh, how they're flowing to support the department but that's the SEC network that's ESPN agreement that's the college football playoffs bowl games SEC championship events are all important revenue streams uh, for SEC schools. The sponsorship agreements. Um, <clears throat> this is for us. Lear Learfield is a third party. We've outsourced our multimedia rights agreement. So Learfield pays us a guarantee each year. So it's a guaranteed revenue stream. They go out and sell the sponsorships to third parties. So they're selling sponsorships to Coca-Cola and Tyson Foods and um, you know, banking partners and, and auto dealerships. So Learfield, that's a way for us to guarantee a revenue stream. They then go out and sell the sponsorship for a Nike school, CLC. <clears throat> so roughly a $20 million a year revenue stream for our department. <clears throat> and then um, ticket sales and donations. <laughs> See how that's played out over time. Uh, there on the left-hand side for us, football, men's basketball, and baseball again are how we, uh, you know, sell the bulk of our tickets. Um, had the big dip during COVID, where we had limits on the number of tickets we could sell within each of our venues. But then we've come back out of that strong, and we've seen fans show up at football, basketball, and baseball to the point we're nearly sold out in each of those venues and then you've got the donations that kind of lighter uh, red part of the chart is the donations that are tied back to those 
season tickets. You know, I like to share for <clears throat> for Razorback Athletics. You know, we're really strong with football ticket sales, men's basketball, and baseball. As you look at college athletic programs throughout the country, some are strong in football, maybe not as much in basketball. Some may be stronger in basketball, maybe not as much in football. We really <coughs> beneficial in the fact we sell at a high level for football, men's basketball, and then baseball as well. One of the differentiators, though, is within the SEC, we're in the bottom third with the size of our football stadium. So as you're looking at our competitors, if you're looking at Texas A&M, Texas coming into the league, Oklahoma, Georgia, LSU, where they've got 80, 90, 100,000 seat venues, they've got larger stadiums, larger fan bases, generating more revenue to support their department. That ends up being one of the differentiators within college athletics at this level. The size of your football stadium, the number of tickets and donations you can generate tied to your football program. Then how we spend money, um, you know, nearly 40% is tied to coaching salaries, benefits, staffs, uh, debt service. You know, we have to borrow money for these facility projects, pay it back over time. Financial aid, student athlete benefits, you know, right at 15%. Uh, severance payments, you know, again, you see these big coaching contracts. If you have to make a coaching change, you know, there's going to be with some some level of severance you're often having to, to fund with a coaching change. Uh, we transfer dollars back to campus. Uh, and then just all these sport operating budgets, the support units, the facility costs, game day operating costs are right at 30% of our operating costs on an annual basis. So just a little snapshot of, of how we spend money. Kind of back to one of the questions Shelby posed. Um, you know, inflation certainly hits us in that bottom bullet point, the day-to-day -day operating costs for an athletic program. Costs more to travel, costs more for hotels, costs more for renting a car, uh, buying fuel. If we're buying supplies for a nutrition center, right? The cost of food is up. You see it in a grocery store if you're shopping for your home. We see it in the market when we're shopping to, to, to feed our student athletes. So those salaries and benefits are things that we control. And certainly uh, you, know, you try to stay competitive, debt service, those are things you agree upon. You kind of know what your debt payments are over a period of time, financial aid, you know, kind of know what those costs are going up each year. <clears throat> that bottom bullet point is really where <clears throat> we've seen significant increases in costs coming out of COVID. A lot of that tied to inflation and just what's going on throughout the economy that we're all all seeing, all all having to, to deal with. Uh, just looking at facility projects, again, this is the, the last decade we've completed you know, $365 million worth of facility projects. We have financed roughly 60% of that, which means we borrowed money, have to pay back over time. <clears throat> you know, roughly 20%, we've had donations through our foundation and roughly 20% um, just athletic and foundation uh, revenues, meaning dollars that we've come in that we've uh, allocated towards facility projects, but again, we've been in this period of significant investment back into facilities over the past decade. That's what our debt looks like. As we look ahead over the next you know, 13 years, and we've got a right at $160 million of debt that we pay back uh, over the next 13 years. That red, uh, red line right there just illustrates the amount per year that we're having to pay back. <clears throat> it jumps up in Fiscal year 25, we actually had to borrow some money during COVID. We refinanced some debt that we're having to pay back over a five-year period. That's why that debt payment ticks up over that five-year period of time. And again, we have no debt beyond 13 years. So we're in a pretty good position from a debt standpoint. Um, a lot of schools have debt out 25, 30 years. We don't have anything for us beyond the next 13 years. So it gives us some good opportunity in the future as we retire current debt to look at new facility projects in the future. 
And this right here is just a snapshot within the SEC. <clears throat> this goes back a couple years with the revenues and expenses, but we're in the bottom third of revenues. And the range is 101 million up to 239 million dollars just with schools within the SEC. So it's hard for a school at 101 million revenues a year to compete with that school at 239. And you can probably guess it with schools on each end of, of that spectrum. You know, we're again bottom third, 150 million dollars is a lot of a lot of revenue to, to support a program, but again, you're you know almost 90 million dollars less than the school with the most resources in the conference. Uh, from a debt standpoint, we're right in the middle with that $160 million. You can kind of see how schools, the amount of money they have taken out in debt and then what those annual debt payments are. See how that stacks up within the SEC. And just another snapshot of that of how over this 10 year period of time, just each of the SEC schools, how revenues have grown. So we're all growing within the SEC. As new dollars come into the conference, everybody gets an equal share, which is you know, something we have to be mindful of that <coughs> if we get, you know, an extra million dollars through a TV rights agreement, that's the same amount going to Alabama and A&M and Tennessee and Florida and others. Um, again, the things that differentiate, differentiate the schools are A&M with that big football stadium, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, <clears throat> schools with the larger stadiums can generate more revenue to support their department compared to some of those at the bottom, the Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Missouri are the schools with the smaller football stadium, smaller support for their, their football programs. If I remember right, whenever I was getting my master's at Arkansas, there was a project on the stadium to actually reduce the capacity of the stadium. Is that right? That to add more luxury seating, loge boxes, that sort of thing, right? Is that still a here is, at Arkansas, here. sir? Okay, yeah, so we actually uh, completed a football stadium project back in 2018, and it was a study we really started probably 2012-13 Time frame, but yeah, that's the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, we were in this era of the explosion of these media rights agreements. So you can watch any game on TV. You can watch any game right on your cell phone. So that, that's a question that athletic directors and CFOs and campuses ask, ask themselves. Do you still need 100,000 seats in your stadium? Do you still need for Razorback Athletics 70,000? And then the types of seats, is that still the type of seat that you need to accommodate your, your fan base? So we studied that for a couple of years. We're 70, 000, at the time, we were 70,000 seat stadium. Uh, we expanded to you know, right at you know, roughly 76,000, but we added premium seats. We knew we did not need more seats. We don't need 100,000. We can't sell 100,000 seats in our, in our football stadium but we knew we could sell suites. We knew we could sell club seats and Lowe's boxes. So those are the types of seats that we added. <clears throat> um, a lot of controversy around the uh, reduced seats. We decided not to reduce. Something we're looking at with our basketball arena now is we're, you know, we're right at, you know, 19,600 seats in our basketball arena in 2024. Is that, do you need that many seats for basketball? <laughs> <clears throat> is a question that schools are asking themselves. Schools that are building new arenas are typically in that eight to 10 to 12,000 seat venue. Not a whole lot of folks building 19, 20,000 seat venues. So those are similar questions that we're asking ourselves now is, do we have the right number of seats, the right types of seats for our fan base? <laughs> What other questions might you have? The class at this point, you hit on a lot there of what we've been discussing. So if you've got anything that, that piques your interest and you want to learn a little bit more about, feel free to ask now. How much does the success of the team affect ticket sales and revenue? Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
How much of the success, how much does the success of the team affect your uh -huh. <clears throat> Excuse me, caught me with a coffee attack. <clears throat> Sid Hoffman, <clears throat> absolutely. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> apologize for that. Absolutely tied to the, the uh, success of your team. Um, <clears throat> we're going through a season ticket renewal process now with football, coming off a four and eight season. So it gets harder to get out <clears throat> and sell football tickets, right? Um, for us, roughly half the revenue is tied to ticket sales and donations. So you're gonna need your team to be successful in order to generate that revenue to support your department. So something we're mindful of, <clears throat> something that you see, you know, throughout college athletics, as you look at coaching changes, often those are times where you're seeing teams that are struggling. They're losing ticket sales, losing donations. Sometimes it makes more sense to make a coaching change, invest back in a new coaching staff to be able to generate that revenue, generate those ticket sales. And alongside that, I know one of the things you mentioned was the severance payments to previous coaches. There was a list, I can't remember where I found it, but there was a list at one point in time, um, Arkansas owed the second or third most to in severance payments to uh, previously fired coaches. So Petrino, Filoma, Morris, I guess at that point. Um, and it sounds like whenever your check came in, I'm a big Hunter Year Check fan. I think everything he's done is brilliant. I'm sure you are too. Uh, but one of the things that he made note of when I rehired Pittman was, okay, we're going to put these clauses in your contract where we're not going to be out the money that we might otherwise be if, for instance, he only gets 50% of his games, right? Uh, that was one of the, the stipulations in that contract. If you win 50%, you get 50% of whatever's left or, or whatever the specifics were. Uh, it sounds like that's something that Eurocheck is aware of and uh, concerned with with regard to the future of your expenditures. Uh, but now we're starting to see coaches at the college level because of NIL, because of the transfer portal, leave high profile college jobs to go to the pros to be a coordinator. Uh, I would, now Arkansas isn't necessarily in that position, but given that trend, is that something that y'all are thinking might be an issue one day if, if you do get a coaching here who is successful and you'd like to keep them, might have to pay them more? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> it, um, I think Shelby, I mean, that's one of the fundamental challenges <clears throat> we have in college athletics right now, in, in specific to Razorback athletics, and specific probably to your question is, if we backed up from 2006 through 2016, the total amount of severance payments for Razorback Athletics were right at $4 million. From 2016 through 2023, the severance payments have been $20 million. And that's a result of changing two football staffs, a baseball staff, and an, or excuse me, a basketball staff and, and an athletic director position <clears throat> over that period of time. So in the last 15 years, as more dollars have come into college athletics through these media rights agreements, dollars have gone into facility projects and dollars have gone into coaching contracts. And then if you're not successful with your team, kind of back to the last question, all of a sudden you've got revenues that are at risk and, and schools making coaching changes. Now you're tied to these big contracts with these big buyouts is what we're seeing within the last you know, six to eight to 10 years of a lot of severance payments that are going to coaches that when you're having to make a, a coaching change, those dollars going to coaches no longer part of your program. For us, that was Brett Bielham and his staff and Chad Morris and his staff are dollars you could not invest back into your program. Um, a lot of the lawsuits, I think in my mind, are really tied to <clears throat> you know, the industry seeing more dollars go into coaching contracts at a time the NCAA had rules in place restricting dollars that could go to student athletes. Coaches could change schools to sign a $100 million coaching contract 
but rules were in place saying student athletes could not change schools to pursue a new opportunity at, at a different school. So a lot of those lawsuits are really the market reacting to more dollars in the sports industry, more dollars in college athletics, and then how those dollars are being directed. And then the student athletes having whatever the appropriate share of those revenues, uh, whatever that might look like in the future. So that's really <clears throat> in my mind what's been behind a lot of these lawsuits. Um, going forward, and I, I, Shelby, I think you're probably right. I mean, just coaches, you now see coaches deciding to either step away or potentially to transition to professional sports just because they're not wanting to deal with the impact of the portal and NIL. And it's just a different day managing a, a, a sports program in 2024 than it was even just a couple of years ago. So schools may be forced to pay more, guarantee more to attract and or retain a coaching staff. <clears throat> it's really on the athletic directors to come up with, hey, if a coach steps away, who's the next one in line that you're going to replace him and her with? So that, that's really what ADs are challenged with is building the pool of coaching candidates to you know, fill these positions going forward. From that point, I wonder, you know, the, the case with Dartmouth and the NLRB, uh, the, the potentiality of student athletes uh, being deemed employees of the university, certainly something that looms large, I'm guessing, in in your world right now. Um, and, and, and with that, you've got consideration of, okay, if that does happen, how do we fix it? Is there potential for a salary cap? Likewise, is it in the future or in, in the back of your mind at all that there might be some sort of salary cap for coaches installed at the collegiate level, at least within football? Um, it, seem, it seems like there's potential there at least with player movement and everything else. Yeah, actually, yeah, absolutely. I mean, just um, and one thing we think about is we know additional revenues are coming through media rights agreements. You know, for us, we've got the stadium naming rights, and you know, we know there's additional opportunities with ticket sales and sponsorships. So more dollars are coming. We have to change, we have to um, change the decisions, how we're making decisions on how we spend those and that's really part of the challenge any AD and athletic program has is we're going to have to make decisions differently going forward. More dollars are going to student athletes than they have in the past. So one of two things have to happen. you got to change how you're spending the dollars. Or like instead of coaching contracts and facilities, it's going to uh, student athletes. Uh, is part of the reality of what we're, we're uh, you know, being faced with. That may be <clears throat> student athletes as employees. That may be additional benefits, <clears throat> you know, through an athletic program, through a university, maybe additional opportunities through NIL collectives, et cetera. So, you know, the hope and the desire and the efforts are in the, the next, um, you know, really 12 to 18 to 24 months in defining exactly what that looks like for this level of college athletics. Within the state of Arkansas, there is one program that is dealing with the challenges at this level. Looks very different than the D1 program in Little Rock that has $140 million less a year to work with. Or the D1 program in Pine Bluff that absolutely is not dealing with the same challenges. So <clears throat> college athletics and what you see you know, at the NCAA and you know, with the SEC and Big Ten kind of forming this advisory group is it's reacting to we're going to have to manage things differently going forward. Revenues are strong. You're forecasting them to be strong going forward, but we're changing how we're spending dollars, changing how we're making decisions. And more of those dollars are going to student athletes. That's what the courts are telling us. So that's really what we're seeing. And, and you got, you know, questions about Congress is, you know, does Congress step in and solve it? Uh, you got questions about the courts or the courts are going to be the ones that solve it, the labor relations board. So um, in the next, again, 12, 18, 24 months, <clears throat> I think we're going to see decisions happen that are going to define what college athlete, um, athletics looks like at this level. And then I, we hope to see, you know, some uh, 
some better structure in place to how schools are managing these things and compensating student athletes and is there a cap on coaching contracts, Shelby? I mean, that's going to be a tough one. I think that goes back a couple of decades ago where there were lawsuits about limitations on <clears throat> some of the restrictions they had in place for uh, assistant coaches salary. So that's probably a tough one, but um, at the end of the day, you're going to have a finite amount of money to spend and to remain competitive. This is my, the CFO's opinion is you're going to see some dollars shift away from coaches towards student athletes as part of what we're looking at in, in the future. I think Gracie had a follow-up question on coaches. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious about how you decide, um, like, where the money goes to what program, because as you mentioned, the football season was 4-8 and eight this year, but I know the volleyball team had a really good season the tournament. So I was just kind of curious about, is it because, you know, football across all college athletics brings in the most money? or how that works? Yeah, great question. And that's going to look a little different <clears throat> on each uh, each campus with, with each athletic program. And we've made a commitment with Razorback Athletics to fund each of our sports at a level to be competitive. And we've done that through investments in facilities, investments in coaching contracts, and, and then just you know trying to create some equality across our sports. So, for example, you know, we have a um, student support center, academic support, nutrition support, mental health support, that's going to uh, um, have resources available to all student athletes. That's the football team, the volleyball team, the soccer team, the tennis team, the swim team. So we make resources like that available to all of our uh, student athletes. We've invested in facilities to that our coaches can recruit to, um, and then just try to fund each of our programs at a level to be competitive. So, you know, we, uh, you know, some of that's tied to some history and like with our baseball program, our track program is just a lot of history with success. Uh, probably two decades ago, we invested in our golf facility that really sparked some <clears throat> or elevated the recruiting and the, the uh, performance of our, our golf teams. We've made the right coaching hires with some of our sports. You know, softball is a great example. I mean, that's a coach that came in. Soccer is a great example. After a couple of years, they really got it going and have sustained some success. Um, back to your question, though, is you know, we uh, have a process we go through, uh, a budgeting process. We sit down with every coach, every unit in the athletic department. We have roughly 60 meetings in a 30-day period where coaches can present to us a funding request. Here's what he or she feels is needed to be successful with their program. Um, and then we compile that and, and decide ultimately what can we afford to to fund in a given year. But um, we kind of have a broad based look at, you know, wanting all of our sports to be successful and trying to provide those resources to help them be successful. Football, you're right, generates the revenue. So you're gonna have to invest in football because it's such an important revenue stream for the department. You're gonna have to invest in men's basketball because it's generating revenue to support volleyball and soccer and track and, and all those other sports. I kind of had a follow-up question. Um, do you, I know women's sports is growing like this year I've seen. Do you expect this trend to like continue on or do you think it's something that the numbers will go back down? And you said women's sports? Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that's going to continue to increase. Um, I mean, you guys, I'm assuming we're all our sport fan. If you're watching what's going on in women's basketball right now, it's phenomenal. Like I was hooked for the final four last March and April, right? Just the, the competitiveness that you saw, just, I mean, it was fantastic. And uh, our volleyball team advanced this year in the uh, tournament, uh, softball, what's going on with the, the World Series each year. Like I, I think we're going to continue to see that. Um, increase in the future, just the number of folks that are either attending events or watching on TV. I think athletic programs are uh, figuring out how to better monetize that. I think we saw that with the NCAA and the media rights agreement that they recently extended is uh, you know, being able to better monetize some of those, not, you know, we call it you know, non-revenue sports uh, to generate revenue, to go back to support those programs. But I think that's an important part of our future there's still a long way away from hitting where football's at, right? Or 
or men's basketball, but you can see, I think it was Nebraska volleyball had a, a maybe it was exhibition match in their football stadium and they sold, you're shaking, maybe 80, 90,000 tickets. Uh, Iowa, I think, did it with women's basketball. So I think the interest is there. I think schools are figuring out how to capitalize on that and keep building the interest and, and then at some point find a better way to monetize it. Good question. The other follow-up question, and then we're running tight on time here. I did have one more relevant to the increased uh, amount of attention that college sport gets. Um, we see, and, and with some of the teams that you just mentioned, with uh, LSU basketball, Ole Miss basketball, you saw those reports where Ole Miss women's basketball, um, I think, lost, what, what the 8.4 million? and LSU women's basketball, seven something million, uh, despite winning the national championship. So while the popularity is growing, there's also uh, increased scrutiny on athletic departments for their spending. Is that something you all consider in these decisions? And if so, how do you communicate that to the public? Yeah, that's a great question, Shelby. And we absolutely <clears throat> see it, you know, for us, football, generates roughly 80 million spends about 40. Men's basketball generates roughly 20 and spends about 10. Baseball breaks even, generates about 5 million, spends about 5 million. Every other sport you're having to subsidize with revenues from football and from men's basketball. So, I mean, that's, that's the financial structure within college athletics at this level, football, Basketball, NCAA, I think, puts out maybe there's five sports <clears throat> that they track their championships, generate a profit. It's football, men's basketball, hockey, and I forget the other two, but um, that's how programs generate the revenue to support their departments. Uh, a women's basketball program, like for us, is a $5 million a year loss. If we generate 500000 revenue and spend $5.5 million. LSU generates, I think they're three to four million maybe a year in revenue, but then they're spending 10 or more. So I, I, I do think <clears throat> the scrutiny is there. I'd look back to, I think athletic programs have to change how they're spending money. More of those dollars are going to go to student athletes, less to a coach. You know, do you have to pay your head basketball coach $2 million a year? I mean, each campus has to make that decision for themselves. Um, and I guess back to your question to Colby or Shelby about how to um, communicate that to the public. I think we've done a poor job over time telling the story for college athletics and the finances around it. We support our student athletes in a lot of different ways. Uh, they can show up on campus and, you know, they're not going to have to pay for a meal with the amount of nutrition that you provide. You got all the gear, you got the academic support, the strength and conditioning, mental health every resource in the world at this level to succeed, we just haven't made them employees or haven't compensated them at a level certainly like what you see with coaches. So uh, I don't think we've told our story well in the past, Shelby, and that's going to have to change. Um, it's kind of just teed us up for the number of lawsuits that we're seeing and um, the negative publicity surrounding that. But part of what probably going forward is changing decisions and doing a better job of telling your story and how you're supporting teams and supporting student athletes. Excellent. Any other questions for Clay before we get out of here? I think that's last, it from us. Thank last, you so much for joining us. Yeah, last thing I would share is just some encouragement. Fantastic industry to be part of. I would encourage you all to network. It's all about your network. You know, start it now while you're on a college campus. Uh, again, back to don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities and, and wish you guys the best with your future.